So Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be talking to you. It's very good to be talking to you too, especially especially today after a historic day yesterday. It's a concept that promised to revolutionise our world. Put passengers in a pod and transport them through a sealed tube at extreme speed using electric propulsion and magnetic levitation. With the prospect of transforming how we travel, billionaires, research teams and governments have been racing to advance the technology and open the first operational system in the face of growing scepticism. But Virgin Hyperloop has just made a massive breakthrough with the first ever passenger test deep in the Nevada desert. Three, two, one, one. What Virgin Hyperloop founder Josh Geigel and head of passenger experience Sara Lucian have just put themselves through could end up being historic. They're the first people to ever climb into a Hyperloop pod and travel through the pressurized environment at 107 miles an hour. The test is a huge step in the technology's advancement, but whether or not this moment ends up being taught in schools alongside the first flight all hinges on what happens next. Since it was conceived, the world-changing promise of Hyperloop has sobered into the long journey of making the first system viable. That's taken some extreme, never-before-seen engineering, complex regulatory negotiations with national governments and a lot of money from some of the world's richest people. In his first interview after the passenger test, Sir Richard Branson spoke to me from Necker Island about the world of Hyperloop. When you first heard about the Hyperloop concept, when it was first described to you, what did you think? I'd heard about the Hyperloop um, idea um, from a, somebody called Will Whitehorn, who uh, had wor has worked for um, Virgin Galactic and worked with me for years. And his grandfather had actually patented um, the Hyperloop system uh, back in the, I think, 19, 1930s. So it was an idea that had been conceived, but it had then laid dormant. And we had a wonderful engineer called Josh Geigel who worked for Virgin Galactic. Um, and sadly, he decided to leave. I asked him why, why he decided to leave. And he explained that um, he wanted to build a Hyperloop system. So I then went to Las Vegas uh, to um, talk to him further about it. And he'd already started constructing a, a, a giant tube in the, in the desert outside Las Vegas. I was ridiculously excited about it. I mean, I could see so many potentials with it. And um, we said, you know, we'd love this to be another Virgin project and um, and put put a bit of money in. And, you know, they've now been beavering away for a number of years. Uh, and yesterday was a very important milestone. Hyperloop's the kind of crazy, bold and daring leap that only someone like Richard Branson could make happen. The prize is huge, but getting there will take guts, left field thinking, and no shortage of money. Branson's investment into what was then Hyperloop One in 2017 has seen the firm go on to lead the pack in Hyperloop system development worldwide. While Hyperloop transportation technologies, Heart Hyperloop and others are all making major strides, it's Virgin that's made the most headway. Brokering regulatory frameworks with governments, commissioning certification centers, building the first test tracks and putting real people into pods. This week's test in Nevada became viable because of all that progress. With a pressurized vehicle developed, life support systems in place, and countless live test runs already undertaken on the 500 meter track, Three. the trial could go ahead with confidence. Watch. the first test ride feel like? Uh, it was surreal. I mean, to build a company that built an amazing product that did something that nobody's ever done before, that got two people on a pod, did it safely. Like, it was it was amazing before we even went down the, down the tube. And then once it was on, it was smooth acceleration, very quiet. 
Uh, I barely noticed any type of bumps at all. It was so smooth and then we came to a stop and I think the only disappointment was that it ended. When you got in, when you climbed in and put those straps on, what, what was going through your mind? Were you nervous? Uh, I wasn't nervous. It was just kind of the journey to get here and building a company that ultimately did this and you know, finding people like BRK, like you know, Richard to support us in that journey to actually believe in what we're doing and help us transform you know, a technology company to something that people are excited about, something that could be part of people's view of what the future of transportation could be like. While the success of this trial doesn't start an entirely new chapter in Hyperloop's journey to becoming operational, it does inject new confidence and credibility into the process, not to mention giving its engineers a morale boost. There'll now be further tests in Nevada while the Virgin team continue their work on regulatory approval and certification for the first system. Progress has been made on regulation with the US Department of Transportation and the firm has committed to building its base for certifying all Virgin Hyperloop systems worldwide in West Virginia, a move it hopes will boost the state's economy and jobs market. India and Saudi Arabia are also both in talks with Virgin to build the first system drawn by the chance to dramatically cut journey times between major cities and boost economic growth. Of course, going from a test track to a live route between cities is a huge task, and work is going on to mature every aspect of the system, not least its passenger pod. Those seats you see in the test will look pretty different in the first system, or with the help of one of the world's most famous architects. Where on earth do you begin with designing pods and stations for a transportation system that, that doesn't even exist yet? In Danish, the, the word for design is uh, form giving, which means form giving, to give form to that which has not yet been given form. Uh, and I think that becomes especially true in the case of working uh, with uh, giving form to uh, the Hyperloop and the Hyperpod. Uh, in, in Project Pegasus, where we are essentially giving form to something that the, that the world has not yet seen uh, and in, 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 a, in a sense try to capture. Because of course, if you make it like, if you make it look like a train or like a very fast train, that, that's what people will see. And I think in, in many ways we were trying to um, create something that feels in, inviting and, uh, and attractive and to a certain extent familiar, but not sort of limited to a different version of something existing, like really try to, to provide this kind of f feeling of, uh, of stepping, stepping into the future. And also like, how do you express something that is, it has to look extremely fast because it is, but also it travels through a near vacuum. So in that sense, uh, it, it doesn't have the same aerodynamic requirements uh, as you would normally encounter. But essentially, you end up with this kind of incredible opportunity to show to the world something for the first time. And, you know, first impressions last. So in that sense, uh, I really hope when people see the, the, the Pegasus part that they, that they kind of get a sense uh, 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 of something new and, and exciting uh, around the corner. Despite the excitement, Hyperloop has encountered growing skepticism over recent years particularly as the early rhetoric has met reality. Those working on the system say they acknowledge this inevitable sway in opinion and are working to advance the technology, addressing many of the concerns that instinctively jump to most of our minds. I wanted to ask Sir Richard about this. As one of the world's most famously optimistic billionaires, what does he make of the naysayers and how does he distinguish between a genius idea and fantasy? I mean, what do you say to the naysayers, the people out there that say, look, this is all just a bit of a far-fetched fantasy, it's never going to go anywhere? They should go and talk to somebody called Paul Griffiths, who runs Dubai Airport. What he is planning to do is to build another airport, the other side of Dubai. His dream is there then to have Hyperloop run um, between, between the two airports, um, but the individual pods to go to individual gates. So the pod will break off for the Los Angeles, and the pod will break off for New York, a pod will break off for you know, Miami um, uh, or Tokyo, and the, the passengers will get out at their gate um, and um, be able to get straight onto, straight onto the plane. By doing it from airport to airport, they won't have to worry about passports or, or security or anything like that, because they would have already been checked. And, and you know, from his point of view, you know, because the two airports are quite a long way apart, um, you know, this means that these two airports effectively become one airport. 
one other example is Mumbai Punai, which you know five and a half hour uh, journey by road, the busiest route in India. So you can imagine how busy it is, uh, littered with car accidents um, every day. Um, you know, long, long traffic jams. Um, and the idea is just to run uh, Hyperloop along the side of the motorway. Um, and there will be a lot of people sitting in cars who are going to be very, very jealous when they see, see the pods whisking by. I know that you're trying to get the first system operational by 2030, but I'm interested, where do you see Hyperloop in 20 years' time? So, you know, 10 years after that first system, how do you see it impacting the world? It depends how much governments get behind it. Um, I mean, the American government have got right behind it, and you know they're they're now going through the whole certification process with us. We've we've got a state in America that have, you know, uh, given us land to set set up the test centres there. You know, the British government are excited to explore ideas with us, and and so I think I mean yesterday was was important. There's still a lot of work to do, but it but it was a giant a giant step in the right direction. It sort of brought the project alive rather than it just being pods shooting shooting uh, down a, a tunnel. Suddenly it was a pod with people. And one of the nice things about watching it was it didn't look like they'd moved. <laughs> I mean, it suddenly had, it had just gone from A to B. But, um, you know, it wasn't until their, their expressions of, of joy when they got to the far end um, uh, broke out that one realised that, um, just, that, it, that it, it had achieved its purpose. It's, it's a virgin company again that's done something you know that kind of historic and groundbreaking do, do you ever get tired of that feeling of that you know just seeing seeing this cool stuff happen <laughs> um uh, never really <laughs> i mean i love i love um ever since i started uh, 55 years ago when i was 15 um you know i love creating things um and um, love creating things that that, that, that are going to make a difference um you know, sometimes we fall flat on our face. Sometimes, you know, we succeed. You know, it's, it's, it's extremely exciting trying to sort of break boundaries and, and push, push things forward. Of course, only time can reveal if Hyperloop was a great idea and whether or not the test that's just happened in Nevada will be reflected on as a quantum leap for human transportation. Until then, we can only watch as Hyperloop teams around the world move forward on their bold and daring journeys pushing the very limits of engineering in their bid to transform our world. If you enjoyed this video and would like to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, subscribe to the B1M.